each week we seem to be dealing with the same reality and, and all of its implications in our life. Uh, but each week I, I continue to marvel at the fact that God's word continues uh, to speak relevantly and clearly uh, into this very moment that we're living in. I know I shouldn't really be all that surprised by it because in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 it tells us this, The word of the Lord is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God's word is living and active, which means we should expect nothing less than for God's word to speak to us uh, relevantly in our lives, whatever it is that we happen to be going through at any given moment. It's true every day as we apply it and read it in our own lives, in our quiet times. It's especially true uh, this morning as we look together uh, at our gospel reading from Matthew 14, verse 22 to 33. See, Jesus is speaking to us this morning and how we are to handle fear. And then we're actually given the very practical implications uh, for what are we supposed to do when we fail to deal with our fear in a godly and good and right way, which is the truth for all of us. We're all dealing with fear this morning, uh, no matter where you are. We're all dealing with the fears of this pandemic, all the uncertainty that is brought into our lives. Many of us, I am sure, have plans for 2020 uh, that have been completely thwarted. Uh, many uh, of your retirement plans have been thrown into question and doubt, uh, maybe financially with the uncertainty of the economy and the stock market. Certainly physically, you can't go out and do the things you had planned to do the trips you had planned to take, the family you had planned to visit. Uh, some have lost jobs, some have gotten sick, some have lost loved ones, uh, and surely so many of us have been isolated from uh, those that we love and cared to be with. And as if those fears weren't enough uh, to deal with, uh, now on to all of that, we have social unrest, we have political angst, uh, and now the cherry on the top today, we have a storm that's working its way up the coast that I can't even pronounce the name of. <laughs> you know, I would certainly say that none of us are strangers to fear. Fear is a, the feeling of anxiety and the concern uh, that the outcome of something or our personal safety or the safety of, of, of other people it's that anxiety that rises of the uncertainty about what's to come in our own lives. We all experience these feelings of anxiety, uh, but we're not the first to feel these feelings of fear, uh, and we're not going to be the last. This morning in our gospel reading, uh, we found Jesus' disciples in just such a state, in that feeling of great fear, being anxious uh, for their own lives and for their safety. We're told that Jesus made his disciples get into a boat, uh, push off into the Sea of Galilee, and, and told them to go on to the other side. Uh, Jesus has just fed the 5,000, uh, which was your printed uh, reading in your bulletin this morning. Uh, and, and he wanted some time to himself to go and to pray and be with the Father. When evening came, we're told that uh, Jesus was all alone. The disciples, meanwhile, uh, haven't made it to the other side of the lake, of uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, they are stuck out there in the middle. The waves are working against them. Uh, the winds are working against them. Pretty much the natural conditions are working against them in this moment. Something I think that we can probably relate to, can't we? The natural conditions struggling against them, them working against us. Uh, we too are struggling against these natural conditions right now. In verse 25, we're told that during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. At, that, at, at, times, uh, at this time in the ancient world, uh, Jews and Romans divided the night into four watches of three hours each. The first watch was at 6 p.m., 
Uh, the second watch would have been at 9 p.m. The third watch would be midnight. Uh, and the fourth watch would be at 3 a.m. Now, I'm an early riser, uh, much to the chagrin of my, uh, my wife and, uh, and my family. I usually wake up somewhere in that 4 o'clock hour, so that within that fourth watch time is usually when I get up in the morning. Uh, which means that I get the duty of taking the dog out into the front for his uh, for her pot potty break. And, and I can personally testify to the fact that it's pretty eerie outside uh, during that fourth watch time. It's dark. Uh, every shadow that gets cast kind of looks like a person who's, uh, who's lurking in the shadows. Every sound sounds like someone or something that's out there that uh, and then the mind starts playing tricks and you think uh they're out to get me uh, i also hate it and this seems to happen all the time uh when we face these hurricanes and these storms that come through when they come through at night it always seems so much worse when they come through in those early hours of the morning when the wind starts whipping but it's dark and you see all the shadows and you hear all the noises it's just eerie isn't it it's just eerie. So it's totally understandable then uh, that the disciples, when they saw Jesus walking on the sea during that fourth hour, in that eerie time of the night or the early morning, uh, that they were terrified. Not only is it eerie at that time of, of night or early morning, uh, but let's be honest, if you saw someone walking on the sea, you'd be a little terrified too, right? Uh, we'd be a little uh, freaked out. Uh, their minds must have been running wild with the possibilities of what this could possibly mean for them and for their personal safety. So in verse 26, we're told exactly what they were thinking, exactly what this eerie uh, scene, what it was doing in their own hearts. Uh, they thought that Jesus must be a ghost. That's what was going on in their mind. And so we're told they cried out in fear, it's a ghost. Now, in the ancient world, uh, we know that sailors were extremely superstitious people. They may still be today, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, but all people, fishermen, sailors, those who made their life on the sea, uh, they were very superstitious, uh, especially about the sea. They believed that people who drowned at sea, whose bodies were not able to be recovered and had a proper burial, uh, they believed that those people continued to haunt the seas. Uh, and that that's why, uh, in this moment, they were terrified for their lives, and they thought that there was this ghost, this apparition, who was coming to get them, uh, and that their lives were at stake. You know, in some ways, I think we do the same thing. When the conditions are working against us, when our lives are, are being threatened, we begin to see ghosts. We imagine the worst. Uh, the fear overtakes our lives, leaving us uh, terrified for our own well-being, for our own lives. I believe it happens to all of us. Maybe it's during a hurricane. Maybe it's because of a virus. Maybe it's because of the economic state of our lives and of our country. Maybe it's the social unrest. Maybe it's a threat of our own health that we're facing. We start thinking of the worst and our lives become full of fear and terror. So what are we supposed to do with that fear and terror? What is the good and the godly thing to do in times of great fear, especially for us today in which we're living? Well, I think we get this good and godly, uh, this perspective on what we are supposed to do from Jesus in verse 27. This is what we're told. But immediately, upon them crying out in terror, I'm, this must be a ghost coming to get us, uh, we're told immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. In that simple statement, Jesus gave them, and, and therefore gives to us, three directives, which are the three godly responses we should have in times of great fear for our lives and our well-beings. Number one, Jesus said, take heart. He said, take heart. That's the first godly response uh, to the fear that we might be facing in our lives. But what exactly does that mean? What, what does it mean to take heart in, in the face of fear? 
Well, today I think we associate the heart when we hear something like this with love. You know, things of the heart have to do with the emotions. That's the way we tend to think about it. Uh, was Jesus telling them that in the face of great fear, what they should have is more love in their hearts? Oh, no, that, that's not what Jesus was telling them. See, six times in the gospel, Jesus uses the same phrase, uh, take heart. And the one that gives us the clearest meaning, I think, as to what take heart means comes in John chapter 16, verse 33. Where Jesus said this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You see, to take heart, what it really means is to have courage, to be courageous. Courage means to act on one's beliefs and convictions despite the dangers that we are facing in life. Jesus is telling us to be create, uh, courageous, therefore, even in the face of life-threatening conditions and circumstances that we might be up against. But courage, uh, without good reason and a good basis for it, would really be nothing more than foolishness. I mean, think about it for a minute. Running out into the middle of a hurricane is not courageous. Uh, that's foolish. Uh, taking zero precautions during a time of pandemic that's not brave and courageous. That's actually foolish. Uh, not storing up food when you know there's a famine coming. That's not courageous. That's actually foolish. What good reason then do we have to be courageous when the conditions around us give us ample evidence that we should be filled with fear and terror for our lives? Well, Jesus tells us in the second godly way that we should face the fears of this world. And number two, Jesus says, it is I. To take heart, it is I. And what Jesus was telling them and what he's telling to us is that he is with us. He promises us that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us, which means that he's always with us. Even in the midst of life's greatest challenges, even when we're facing the worst conditions we could ever possibly face, when our lives are at hand, and in danger, Jesus is with us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. And Jesus, as we heard in that John passage, is the one who has overcome the world. The one who's with us is the one who has overcome the world. Meaning he took on our sin. He was betrayed and suffered. He died the death that we deserve for our rebellion. And Jesus on the third day rose from the grave, destroying death forever. Jesus has overcome everything, and he did it for us because he loves us. Jesus has overcome everything for us. Viruses may come. Financial struggles will come. Storms will threaten us. We will suffer, but none of it can possibly destroy us because Jesus has overcome it all. When we are in him, therefore, our future is secure. Our lives have been bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. In the face of fear, we're to remember, to never forget that Jesus is with us. And because of his presence, there is nothing that can destroy us. Which brings us to the third godly way that we're to respond to fear in our lives. Jesus said, take courage. I am here with you. And the third thing he says is, therefore, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. What's the opposite of fear? Well, in some ways, the opposite of fear is faith. Jesus is telling us to put our trust in him. You see, fear, though, is not the absence of all faith. Uh, fear has a way of exposing false faith in our lives. When we find our lives being consumed by fear, uh, what we find is that the things that we have ultimate, that we've ultimately been trusting in for our lives, those things can't save us. That's when the fear comes. Most of us on a practical level trust in our own health. We never imagine in any one moment uh, that anything bad is going to happen. So when our health is threatened or does fail, uh, our false faith that becomes, it gets called into question. Guess what? 
We can't trust our own health all the time. And what happens in that case when the false fear gets exposed for what it really is, a false faith, that's when we become consumed with fear. Most of us think if we have enough money, we'll be safe and we'll always be happy. When our misplaced faith is in our bank accounts, when it gets threatened in any way, fear and terror come flooding in. They're the fruit of the false faith that we have in the things of this world. If you find yourself being consumed by fear, at the bottom of it, you will find the source of where you've been putting your trust in this life. What have you been putting faith in? Jesus says, don't be afraid, meaning, trust me, trust me. Put your faith in me and know that when you're in me, I have overcome the world. Your life and your future is secure in me. This is the godly way of addressing our fears in this life with courage, with Jesus by our side, and with trust in him, the one who has overcome the world on our behalf. Jesus makes that very clear in how he addresses uh, his disciples in that moment of terror in their lives. It's what he's calling us to today. But let's be honest, it isn't that easy. It's not that easy. We all fail at it. We all continue to be filled with fear when things keep creeping up in our lives that we can't control and expose all the false faith that we have in the things of this world. It's here, I believe, that verses 28 to 31 speak to our own hearts. See, Peter, in a moment of courage, or rather might be foolishness, uh, said this next to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus simply said, come. Now, mind you, uh, this was Peter's idea. This wasn't Jesus's idea. Uh, this is what Peter had it in his own mind to do, not what Jesus necessarily wanted him to do. And so in verse 29, we're told that Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came to Jesus. Well, all's well so far. Uh, but then in verse 30, we're told, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And when he got afraid, he began to sink. See, Peter's courage and faith was not actually in Jesus at all. When he saw the wind, or in other words, when he looked at those conditions that were working against him and that were threatening his own life, the source of his own faith was exposed and the result was fear and he began to sink. I think we can all relate, especially right now with all that's going on in our lives. But the good news, the incredible gracefulness of what we see happening here is that when Peter, uh, in the midst of his own fear, he called out to the Lord. Lord, save me, he called. In the midst of his own fear, Lord, save me. And in verse 31, we're told, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Friends, the godly call in the face of fear is to be courageous, remember that Jesus is with us, and put our faith and trust fully in him. But the good news of this gospel of grace is that when we fail, when we call, when we fail, when we begin relying and trusting in other things, putting our faith in the wrong places, when we fail, when we call out to Jesus, in the midst of that faithlessness, in the midst of our own doubts, the Son of God, who has overcome the world, will reach out his hand, and he will take hold of our lives. Friends, the message for us this morning is this. We can either be consumed by the tears and the fears of this life, which are never ending, or in the midst of our even faithlessness and doubt, call out to Jesus to save us and find in him a life of security. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this gracious picture 
Lord, we all fail to live perfectly out the, the good and right way to face the fear, to be courageous, to remember that you're with us, and to put our faith and trust in you. We fail at it daily. We put our faith in the things of this world and we trust them, and they inevitably let us down, and they leave us completely vulnerable because they're empty. They cannot save us. But thank you when we find ourselves in that moment sinking into the abyss of the fear and the terror, when we call out to you, Lord, save us. But Jesus, you are faithful to reach out in your love and grab hold of our lives and lift us back up. Lord Jesus, we need this now. We are living in the midst of so much uncertainty, so much fear. But our faith has been exposed in some dramatic ways. We've been trusting the wrong things, the wrong people, the wrong systems. Trusting even too much in ourselves, thinking that uh, we can ensure our own safety and our own well-being. All of that's being laid bare. Jesus, all we can hope for, all that we need is you. Help us, Holy Spirit, to call out to our Savior. Save us. And thank you for this beautiful picture that you will lift us up, that you will bring us to you. We will know that peace that surpasses all understanding. And we give you thanks. Jesus, we pray all this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen.